Okay, hello and welcome to Pi Global 2021. My name is Zach Lee. I'm really happy to be here and be your host for this session. I would like to now welcome April to our session. And she will talk about the desk from POC to production. And April has been developed software in finance for over 15 years. She has extensive experience in designing and developing data platform and data intensive application from investment banking and investment fund. April need the research data science platform at Arrowstreet Capital, providing researchers with the last technology and technical in data analysis, calculation, and visualization. So let's move the time to April. Thank you. I make you as a co-ho again. Okay, there we go. All right, Good. tactical challenge is over. Thank you, everyone. Apologies for those uh, those challenges. Uh, so my name is April Rathi, as, as Zach said, and I'm excited to be here today to take you through our journey as we took Dask from POC to production. I am the head of the research data science platform at Arrow Street Capital, where I lead a team of quant developers. Arrow Street Capital is a quantitative investment firm in Boston. And our goal is to generate sustainable alpha, which means returns in excess of a benchmark for our institutional investors, primarily pension funds. We do this primarily through investments in global equity strategies. In order to achieve, achieve sustainable alpha, we constantly go through innovation cycles. So the research team is responsible for looking for information that is highly relevant to price, yet less obvious to other, other investors. In order to support this, we need technology. And so my team's responsibility is to identify, integrate, and build technologies to make those research innovation cycles faster and easier, which brings us to Dask. So a brief recap of Dask. This information is taken from the Dask website, and there's loads of information available there, as well as talks available in explaining what it is. But I'll point out the key features from our perspective. Um, the first is that Dask is written in Python. So it's a distributed computing framework, a parallelization framework that integrates natively with the PyData stack. It provides interfaces that are familiar to people who are used to working with NumPy arrays and Pandas data frame objects. And it provides two levels of parallelization in terms of APIs. You can do it implicitly, where there's parallelization built into data frame, array, and bag objects when you're using them, or you can do it explicitly where you define the task graph, where you define the partitioning strategy, and you can use Dask delayed in features. The other core feature of Dask, which we found key to our use case, was that it was really built for interactive use. And that manifests itself in a number of ways, but one of those that we find really useful is the ability to run Dask locally on a local cluster, and then when ready, remotely on a distributed cluster when you're ready to gain additional compute capacity. The context of this particular work that we undertook was that we really liked using Dask locally. We had started using it individually on a one-off projects, but we wanted to expand it as a tool to be used across our entire research team easily. That meant seamlessly switching from local to remote clusters, having user or job dedicated clusters that we could really create from anywhere and seamlessly switch between those different contexts. The challenges that then emerged as part of this goal was really focused on four areas, hardware, the stack of technologies that we needed to learn and how we could make that easy, how we would access data, and which Dask APIs mapped best to our use cases. Which takes us to the scope of this talk, which is to walk through the five stages that we undertook as we walked through expanding the use of Dask to our entire team. We started first with our use cases, which I think is essential for any technology project thinking about where your constraints are, what capabilities you're trying to achieve so that you can make the best technical and architectural decisions. We identified three use cases for Dask. The first was exploratory research. Um, so this is where we're working with new vendor data sets, trying to find new information, either um, in any of the structures of data that we might have, either in a set that we've already got where there's existing attributes we're not using or in totally new data sets that we're exploring. We often started initially working with smaller data sets, but then quickly want to expand our analysis once we have an idea that we think might work. We often also merge results. So we need to integrate it with existing data sets or existing metrics to get a feel for how they compare. The second use cases are our simulations. This is where we're doing what if analysis, asking questions like, what if this portfolio existed? How would it have performed over a, the whole history um, of our investments? 
or if we change these configurations or these toggles on our systematic investment process, what would happen? And so these tend to be path-dependent calculations where the output of one task is an input to the next and are kind of complicated in order to parallelize. The third use case are our historical data processing requirements. And we do this for a number of reasons, two of which are backfills. If we have a new idea, we'll want to backpopulate that all the way back as far as the data exists. And the second is to incorporate restatements. So we'll get updates from our vendors. We then need to incorporate those and reflect those in our computations. Out of these three use cases emerge three computation patterns. Those that are embarrassingly parallel and easily partitioned by constructs like date. Those that are path dependent, which require the output of the previous task as an input to the next task. And processes that are combination and bring these two things together in order to complete. We also wanted to think about where we wanted to run the computations from. And so this is an important input into the infrastructure decisions that you may make. We wanted to run them from, on, from our desktops, right? For our exploratory use cases, where we're using PyCharm or VS Code or notebooks, as well as from our scheduled or systematic processes, which could be in AWS running as server services or on our on-prem servers. And it was key that there was a minimal change required to change between those contexts. Um, we didn't have to rewrite code. We wanted to really do it as much through configuration as possible. So understanding those constraints, those use cases, we moved immediately on to our cluster infrastructure, um, which I think if you look at some of the DAST documentation and literature, you'll see that this is really one of the most challenging parts of the process. Um, and so for us, we stepped back first and just described what did we want to achieve? What did we want to work? And we defined really an ephemeral stack. We wanted everything created on demand and isolated so that there was no resource contention um, or scheduling needed in order to decide who would win um, in order to get the resources that we wanted. So we wanted ephemeral hardware as well as DAS clusters with burst capacity to respond to whatever requests we needed, minimal startup time for that cluster, the ability to apply both templated as well as custom resource specifications, and because we had ephemeral requirements, we needed cost transparency, attribution, and automatic cleanup of all of those resources, right? So we needed to make sure we didn't have runaway costs. So we made some early decisions. We knew we were gonna have to use a cloud provider to provide burst capacity. And we went with AWS because this aligned with some of the other efforts we had underway. We knew we would need a resource manager. So we decided to look at both Kubernetes and HPC. And most importantly, we knew this would have to be a collaborative effort. It wasn't something that we could do just within research, uh, just within the quant dev team. We needed help from our central infrastructure teams, our cloud infrastructure teams, our research systems teams. And so we were able to come up with this collaborative effort from, of teams and skills across the organization to make this happen. We started first with our container service options and looking at what we could use, including batch, ECS, and EKS. Dask doesn't care. Um, so we started out thinking that Dask would have an opinion around this, but it doesn't. Um, it can really run on, on any infrastructure and any container service option that you choose. And so we decided to align this with our internal um, decisions, some other projects and processes that we had um, underway, and to really lean into the open source community and the Kubernetes options um, that were available. And so we went with EKS, even though it was more complex um, and had you know, more challenges in kind of running it and keeping it going, it gave us more flexibility. And because we had some of the resources and experiences internal to our teams, we were comfortable with that decision and the long-term flexibility we would gain from doing that. We then looked at our compute layer options, Fargate and EC2, where our considerations were really around startup time and flexibility. We went with EC2 because we didn't want any constraints around the resource profiles that we would be able to leverage. We wanted to be able to use GPUs, we wanted to have any size memory or CPUs, and we didn't want any limits on our scaling requirements so that if we have lots of researchers coming at one time who want to use their own clusters, they can do so without stepping on one another. Which resulted in a setup of us having EKS on top of EC2, where we then leveraged another a, a set of concepts within uh, AWS in order to fulfill the requirements that we defined. We use AWS accounts for separation between our ad hoc and our scheduled use cases to ensure that there was no accidental uh, impact from our user-driven requests on our schedule or production processes. We use namespaces then within those accounts to give us that isolation of user or job so that the hardware, the infrastructure is all per request and we allow for multiple per user. 
We use AWS auto scaling groups per EC2 instance type. And you can see here just some of those names, right? So I can have the C5X large and I can have as many nodes as I want spun up in terms of EC2 instances. We use tagging for cost visibility at a number of levels to allow us to slice and dice alert and report later on. We use CLIs that exist in the open source community around Kubernetes for investigations wherever possible. We use ELK for logging so that our logs persist across clusters and we don't have to keep the clusters around to understand what happened. And then we use S3 for data so that we have the scalability required to respond to large numbers of workers when they spin up. This illustrates what the cluster lifecycle looks like when a user requests a new cluster. We start first with mapping an AD user to an IAM role and a Kubernetes role so we can lean into Kubernetes security. We then immediately create the namespace container, setting up security and networking. We then use AWS auto scaling groups for creating the nodes. Those nodes are then allocated or assigned to that namespace and join the cluster. And then on top of that, we create our Kubernetes deployment, including our ingress certificate, the services and certificates. Deletion is then triggered by one of two events, either we close the cluster or the harvester terminates it due to an inactive period. In either scenario, it deletes all of the resources, the deployments, the nodes, the node groups, as well as the namespace, so that there are no uh, resources that exist post the specific use or request. And this is just a view then on what it looks like across accounts and users. On the left, you can see the production account where it has a service account connecting from one of our production services and creating its namespace for its specific job. And then on the right, you can see the ad hoc account where different users can come in and request one or more namespaces with their own node groups, with their own uh, EC2 instance types that live for the life of their request. So with the hardware decisions made, the next thing we had to do was figure out what the Dask integration would be on top of that. So our challenge was really to ensure that we were creating and using Dask interfaces that minimized the barrier for use, just made it easy, um, but also allowed for expert user customization later on once everyone had, had really gotten to that expert level over time. It needed to integrate with our EKS and AWS infrastructure for cluster creation, ensure that all the connections were secure between the cluster and clients, and then easily allow us to transition between that use of a local and remote cluster. We looked at the options out there. Dask is a very rich community in terms of packages and libraries and options. Um, unfortunately, none of these fit our use exactly. Um, there was a very interesting kind of use of, of, you know, which ones deal with hardware versus which ones just deal with deploying um, the cluster, Dask cluster on top of existing hardware and what the security assumptions are um, under e each of these libraries. And so none of them were exactly what we needed, but they gave us a lot of inspiration and allowed us to understand how other people were approaching the problem. We ended up building a custom Python module and CLI on top of our AWS constructs to manage our namespaces, node groups, um, and nodes. We use Boto3 for AWS service interactions and the Kubernetes API for interacting with EKS and deploying our Kubernetes deployments. This module automatically ensures that we apply security, namespacing, and tagging to our clusters, ensures that the harvester is set up to look for those inactive clusters that should be taken down, and allows us to apply our parameterized kind of customized uh, Dask Kubernetes deployments in order to create our Dask clusters on top of that hardware. We then extended um, our, the Dask distributed cluster to provide our cluster interface. And it really just sets up an injection point for us to interact with that underlying module. It allows us to use our templates. So we like to use templates as much as possible and then allow for overrides. It calculates the number of EC2 instances based on those parameters and then ensures that our client environment matches our uh, cluster environment or our worker environment um, by setting up some standard conventions. We also extended the Dask client, um, which just again gives us an injection point, an abstraction point to set our security context consistently and register any default worker plugins. And here below you can see an example, um, and it looks very familiar because it looks just like the Dask documentation. Uh, the Dask interfaces are very nice to use. They're easy to extend. They're easy to add your own customizations wherever you need, and they're very thin. Um, so neither of these extensions are, are large code bases. Um, they're pretty straightforward. They were relatively easy to write, but they give us that nice injection point to work with going forward. And here at the bottom, you can see obviously first, you know, the number of kind of different customizations around templates and parameterization options we expose. 
And then using the client looks just like, again, all the documentation that you see out there, which means we can still lean on and use and leverage all the work that people have put into the Dask community. So the final stage, which is one I think that people don't often get to in a lot of the Dask documentation and examples that are out there, is to think about data access. Um, you know, it changes. The minute you want to be able to access it in a number of different contexts from a number of different scalability levels, you can run into trouble. And so we wanted to ensure that this was really easy and that data access didn't become a blocker when we wanted to use Dask in one of our processes. So our challenge was to think about how we could use Dask to access data sets that existed really in our existing formats. We didn't want to have to reformat or replatform our data in order to be able to use Dask. Um, our data is primarily in files on NFS on-prem today. So we knew we needed a single interface that would allow us to access files on-prem and in AWS, uh, that it would work for to both a local cluster and a remote cluster, that we would need to think about our data partitioning strategies in those files, whether the files were big stacked files or already partitioned by a construct like date. And then we needed to think about the data interfaces, both intra-process, so within a single process, how is data exchanged? And now that Dask was in the mix, um, there's pickling that can go on. So communication between the client and the cluster, as well as between the workers in the cluster for data sharing as well as our inter process. So where we have a scheduled process that's part of a wider chain, we didn't wanna to have to change the inputs or outputs or have those be affected. We wanted those interfaces to stay the same. So we built a number of modules to just make this seamless. Um, and again, this was leveraging a number of constructs in the open source community already. We built a, model, a module to help with synchronization, just to allow us to easily move data back and forth from um, our local shares to S3 using S3FS and Boto3. We also built a data store module that allows us to, through configuration and environment setup, seamlessly switch between S3 and local data stores. Um, we also have the ability to override that. So you can say, go to this specific data store. And we support a read through, read fall through precedence so that people don't have to hunt around for files. It will simply choose the best one based on a precedence definition. And then we also implemented a Pandas IO extension that allows us to do read and write uh, seamlessly interacting with that data store. So again, it's all just set up automatically for our users. Um, you can see here at the top, just some examples of how we've got these definitions around data store names. Um, there's read data stores, there's write data stores. They can be different. Um, if you don't specify a data store and you're just doing a PDX using our extension and doing a write or a read on a data frame, it uses your environment configuration, which was local when I did this. Uh, but you can also overwrite it. And here's a case of where I went to S3 instead. And it just uses the same interfaces um, with very little effort on our part. So we had everything in place. We were really excited. We were ready to start rolling Dask out to the team more widely. So we thought, very, uh, thought a lot about how we would do that, how we would make it easy for people to get going. And we decided that the best way is really to provide examples, to integrate it into three processes. And so we chose them based on two dimensions. The first being runtime. We wanted to have the biggest impact possible in terms of the critical path of some of our processing chains. And we wanted to demonstrate different Dask integration patterns so that we could help people see the ways that you could use Dask. Our first example was easy to choose. Um, it was already using Dask as a local cluster, and it was embarrassingly parallel task. Um, so it was a larger than memory data set. The files were partitioned by date. And all we had to do was switch from using uh, the client directly with a local cluster default to using our rec cluster with the right specification. And over here, you can see the task graph, which is very boring. It's a single list of tasks all run in parallel uh, that then is executed. The next two examples were a bit more interesting. Um, example two was using the data frame. Um, so this was really excellent to demonstrate to people how easy it was to use it. You simply switch to using the DAS data frame instead of pandas. But we had to do a rewrite because of the type of processing that we were doing, which had a lot of group buys, a lot of repartitioning um, based on the structure of the computation. And we were able to leverage DAS data frame with map partitions and set index in order to implement this computation. And then the third example was one of those combined examples. And these are really the trickiest ones. So the ones where steps have to be done serially and then other steps can be done in parallel. Again, it needed a major rewrite to group those types of processes together. And it was a multi-stage process where we did some locally on the client side, some on Dask, and then brought data back together again. That was built using Dask delayed. In terms of results, um, we were able to achieve really good speed ups. Um, and I think these three examples nicely demonstrated some of the flexibility we gain, right? So we can choose different EC2 instance types per 
job. We can use different numbers of instances, different numbers of task workers. We have different costs because of that. And we can gain different speed ups based on the profile of the process that we're looking at. The final step of the rollout was really ensuring that we provided cost transparency. So we wanted to just kind of give people the flexibility to do what they needed to do with no constraints and no barriers. But to do that safely, we also needed to give information, provide visibility on what you're about to do so that you aren't surprised at the end by what you ended up doing. Uh, so we provide cost transparency in three ways to the research team as we're using it. The REC cluster upon creation reports back an estimated cost per hour. So this is really useful because you know what you're doing. You kind of can watch the clock ticking a little bit and you know what you're running up in terms of cost. So there's no real surprise bill then at the end. The second are reports. So we're able to slice and dice by the tags that we've added to our infrastructure, things like user, namespace, and job to do real attribution down to a very low level around where our costs are being driven from. And then finally, we've set up a number of email alerts just to give visibility when people are approaching some targets or some thresholds or limits that we've set. These aren't hard limits. They aren't intended to stop people from using whatever they need to complete the projects that they're working on, but it's about giving that visibility, right? Letting people know what is about to happen. That concludes my talk for today. And I think Zach, you're about to give me notice of five minutes. So that's great timing. Um, if this work is interesting, if anybody has questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. There's my email address as well as the website for, and LinkedIn profile for Aerostreet. Yes, thank you, April. Perfect time. <laughs> I worked <laughs> on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a, I got a question from Philip. Um, he's asking, I would like to know whether one could use that delayed object over that data farm for this kind of structure be allowed it by Dask. Yeah, so this is this idea of the, the different ways that you can use Dask. And, and I think this is one of the great features of Dask, right? It has Dask data frame, which just operates like a pandas data frame. Most features and options are supported. It, it's pretty close. Um, and it means you don't have to understand what's happening, how the parallelization is happening. It's just done for you. So it's really implicit. Dask delayed then is where you know, let's say you were doing a loop across dates. Right? I'm going to go through and I'm going to calculate this for every single date. Um, that would be a case where you could use DAS delayed. Right, You're doing manual partitioning. You're defining the partitioning by something like date. And you have a collection of these tasks that can then be executed. You've defined a task graph. And so both use cases are fantastic. They just fit different patterns of what you're trying to do. And so for us, DAS delayed fits really nicely with these embarrassingly parallel or partitioned types of work that you can do. And DAS data frame fits better with our um, path dependent processing, where we want to optimize really every single path computation. And we could then leverage data frame underneath to do that for us. OK, so thank you. Another question is, what were the biggest challenge introducing DAC to users who like pandas? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think. At the end of the day, there's still complexity. So we've, we've created all these interfaces. We've created all these layers. And when things go well and there aren't problems, it's great. You don't even know what's going on. You just gain this kind of magic capacity. Um, but when things go wrong, when things stop working, um, it can be hard to unpick why, right? So you can get things like these features exceptions coming out of Dask. What does that mean? What happened? Which layer of the stack actually had a problem? And so I think, you know, again, it's great. We give it to people that can start working with it and then gradually they'll hit errors and that's where we'll train them about how to deal with that. And so we're kind of able to do this very layered learning approach, um, but that's the hardest part. Like at the end of the day, there are still a lot of layers. There are a lot of things that can go wrong. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of moving pieces. Um, and so you can't completely abstract that away, especially in cases of errors where something didn't work the way you expected it to do. Okay, so last question from Brian. Um, do your researcher use Jupyter Hope running within your KAS crypto running locally with a remote connection? Yeah, so we don't currently use Jupyter Hub. Um, that's something that we're kind of looking at as one of the next things we want to do. Right now, if people are using notebooks, they're just running them locally um, on their desktops. Okay. Okay, we still have some time. We get one more question. Um, for single machine research, how important was to was it to turn the desk 
configuration on your machine? Did it just work out of the box? Yeah, we didn't have to do um, much Dask configuration. Um, you know, most of it, it does work just out of the box until you get into some very specific um, use cases, some very specific requirements. Um, and so I think it is one of those things as, as with a lot of libraries is that you start with the defaults, um, you then hit errors or hit kind of cases of, of problems and figure out which ones you need to tune around that. But, you know, out of the box, it, it does work um, and it works for most cases that you're starting to work with um, generally. Okay, thank you, April. Our time is over. Could you kind of move the discussion to the snack or get a time? And thank you so much, April, to talk for being part of the PyDeter Global 2021. Thank you so much. Thank you.